The Heat showed some toughness versus the Sixers, but there's always room for improvement. And with Manny fans looking to the offseason as their best chance to build a title contender, which teams should they hope will implode for Miami to land a superstar? Plus, should the recently waived Goran Dragic be on Miami's radar? And is Bam Adebayo right that he should have been a two-time Defensive Player of the Year? We debate that on today's Locked on Heat. You are Locked on Heat, your daily Miami Heat podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome to Locked On Heat, your daily podcast on the Miami Heat. However, you might be tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for making Locked On Heat. Your first listen every day. I'm Wes Goldberg here with David Ramil. Uh, we're going to get to our ranking of teams that the Heat fans should hope implode over the next couple of months. And Bam Adebayo calling out Rudy Gobert and Marcus Smart in a minute. But we have to start with this news out of Chicago that the Bulls have waived our old friend, Goran Dragic. And so now we get to speculate if the Heat should bring back Goran Dragic, who's 36 years old and averaged six points a game this season, but is also Goran Dragic. Beloved figure in Miami Heat history. Uh, as for the technicalities, because he was waived before March 1st, Dragic would be eligible to play in the playoffs if he joins another roster. And the Heat, they have room under the under the luxury tax to sign him to a prorated veteran minimum. Uh, it would, however, require them to waive a player in order to create the roster spot. But before we get into who the Heat could waive, David, mm. are you ready to bring back Goran Dragic? <sighs> no. Uh, not really. Like, not at the cost of waiving a current player on the roster. I don't know that there's anybody on there that is deserving of the outright wave. I, I know people will say, oh, wave Kyle Lowry. You know, that's not going to happen. They're not going to eat the remaining 30-some-odd million dollars of his contract. So that's not going to happen. I, I would love to see the reunion. I, You know, I, I maintain and have for a long time that Goron is the best point guard in Heat franchise history. Having mm -hmm. said that, he's older. And I'm not sure how much playing time he'll get. And I don't know that he deserves to be added to this roster as a witness to what happens over the remaining, however long Miami has this year. Just to watch from the bench, not really get any kind of significant playing time, and not really be able to contribute in, in any kind of meaningful manner. Like, I'd love them to readdress this in the offseason and bring him back as kind of the torchbearer of Heat culture from a veteran perspective, now that Udonis Haslam is likely to, or not likely, he's going to retire at the end of this year. So I think Goran makes sense because he's always been such a big fan of Heat culture. He's always been such a believer in the work, very good relationship with Eric Spolster in the front office. Whenever he comes to town, uh, you can always see Annie Ellisberg, Pat Riley, and everybody else talking to Goran. He's, he's a part of the Heat family and will be forever. Yeah. He is a Heat lifer even if he's not on this roster. So I'm just not sure that adding him right now, after having just added Cody Zeller and Kevin Love, is the right decision. What about you? Well, I'm glad you bring up the Kyle Lowry thing. The Heat can't do that. You can't just wave Kyle Lowry and, and not have to pay his contract. There's no amnesty clause available for the Miami Heat to use. Like, that doesn't exist. So they would have to wave and stretch him, which would put them on the books for like $9 million a season over the next three seasons to, to yeah. for Kyle Lowry not to play. They would be paying him not to play. So that's not an option. When you're looking at the options uh, of who the Heat could waive, it would be Haywood Highsmith, Omer Yurtsevin, or Udonis Haslam. It's not going to be Udonis Haslam because he's a Heat legend and they're going to let him retire the way that he wants to retire. And as much as Heat fans want to complain about it, go ahead and complain. Yell it out. Tweet it all you want. It ain't going to happen, right? I, very unlikely that it happens. Is that still um, a discussion point? Because I, I, if I, it has been, I haven't, I haven't If it is, it. I don't care. But look, okay. I, I kind of get it. Like, it's like, hey, he's not in the rotation. He's going to retire you at the end of the year. Why don't you just retire now yes. and then just bring in Goran Dragic? Um... Would you D I, I, I could voluntarily give up his spot? I could, I could see the, the front office. Yeah. I, I could see the logic behind it, but it would require UD giving up his own spot. And if he does do that, uh, cool, I guess. But I, I also kind of, that would kind of suck. I, I kind of want Udonis Haslam to just oh, yeah. play out this final season. I, it's such, it, it's such a moot discussion point. Heat fans have been wondering why Udonis Haslam has been on the roster 
for the last half decade, if not more than that. And I'm just, I'm just over it. It's not even a fun conversation to have, and I don't really care to have it now. Um, so that, that to me leaves Haywood Highsmith and Omer Yurtsevin as the two more likely guys. I don't think it would be Haywood Highsmith. He's sort of your insurance policy in case one of your wings get hurt and he has to play some minutes. I, I, I what's Omer Yurtsevin doing on this roster right now? He has not played all season. He's going to be a free agent, a restricted free agent, but a free agent at the end of the year. He has almost no real market value unless you're a team that really was high on Omer Yurtsevin and wants to take a risk on whatever Omer Yurtsevin looks like after this after this foot surgery that he just had. And and I, I'm just wondering, like, hey, if you don't think he's going to play for you and you love how Cody Zeller has looked and you like the Kevin Love edition and you're comfortable with where you are in the front court, he is the insurance in case of an injury, but you also have Orlando Robinson there with like eight days left on his two-way contract as a break glass in case of emergency option. I don't know. I I do wonder if the Heat, if they're not convinced that they're going to bring back Omer Yurtsevin as a restricted free yeah. agent, then and if they don't want to tie up their cap with with the with whatever it takes to get him on the restricted free agency more, all these things, why not waive him and go ahead and get Goran Dragic? Because at least he provides a level of depth that you don't really have. At that point guard spot, because right now Kyle Lowry working his way back might play as soon as this week. But even with Lowry, you still have all the injury concerns that's, that that you've been dealing with with him over the last couple of years. Gabe Vincent's your only other point guard, true point guard on the roster. I don't know. I think you can bring Goran Dragic back, not as a starter, not maybe even as your backup, but as as a point guard on the roster, as an insurance policy for so, for the, one of these other two guys. It kind of feels like Dragic would have more of a chance to make a contribution over the next 20 games in the playoffs, and Omer Yurtsev uh, would at this point. I, I can't disagree with that. I, I, I hate to say it because, you know, Yurtsev and still just 24. Yeah. And there's potential for him to grow, but this has been such a terrible lost season for him that I don't know that he can be reincorporated into the roster. And I don't know that even if he was at his best, and it's almost a guarantee that he's not going to be at his best whenever he does return – that he's going to be able to supplant Cody Zeller, who right. seems like a, just a better fit right now. You know, yeah, with when Zeller brings the tip, yeah, like Yurt Seven might have more touch as a shooter. Of that, I don't have any doubt, and I don't know that we're still going to count him on him to be a regular fifteen to twenty foot foot you know jumper kind of player. So I, I'm not sure what he's going to bring. He's a great rebounder and everything else. Like, and we love Yo Omer. Yeah. We love the. I, I love there. his ceiling, but he's a free agent. You know, it, this wouldn't even be a conversation if he was under contract for next year. It wouldn't be. Right. So I, yeah, it's a it's a very good point. And wait, waiving him this, uh, this uh, currently, would they still be able to sign him as a free agent over the summer or would they be prevented from doing so? I'm not really sure on the rules on that. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure either. So I, I get the feeling that they would. Uh, if he was traded Probably. to another team and then bought out, there's, I think, a year before they can add him back. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, if, if he clears – because you want to avoid tampering. Yeah, if he clears waivers and he's a free agent, you can just re-sign him whenever. Yeah, I, I see no right. reason why they would be precluded and from doing that. And you can just that. say, look, you know, we, we love you here. We want to continue to be invested in your development. But right now we've got Zeller who's playing in game shape. There's no timetable for your return. We want to make sure that you take the whole summer and then we'll bring you back at that point yeah. in time. I I think it makes a lot of sense. Like, and this is not a knock on Omer. I think it's just a realistic well perspective yeah. on what he's incapable of doing at this point in time. And in terms of what Dragic is capable of doing, look, he's he's 36 years old. He's not the player that he was even in the bubble and what he was at his peak for when you say he was the greatest point guard in Miami Heat history. To which a statement I won't I won't disagree. I'll throw Mario Chalmers name out there, not to yeah, say God. that he's the greatest. We're not talking- but it, we're not it, talking greatest player in franchise history. We're talking point right. guard. Yeah, Chalmers was positionless. You're right. Um, he's shooting 35% on threes this season, Goran Dragic is. That's not great. No. He was usually around a 37% shooter in Miami. So it's it's a hair below what he, a couple hairs below what he was shooting in Miami. But it would also be third among rotation players on this <laughs> Heat team. Which is more of a statement on how bad the Miami Heat have been shooting this year, unless, but it would be helpful in that regard. Forty-eight percent on two pointers this year. I don't. I also, when you kind of talk about what we were talking about with Kevin Love and Cody Zeller about, hey, you're bringing in some veterans with some know-how and can kind of reinvigorate the locker room and all these things. Like that's also Goran Dragic, one of Jimmy Butler's best friends in the league, beloved in that locker room, absolutely. And when you're talking about needing a spark. Goran Dragic could provide that spark in any room that he, he he walks into, including the Miami Heat's locker room. So 
I don't know. It could be an option. Uh, I, I don't really know what the plan is. He was waived uh, a couple hours before we started recording this podcast. And um, and so there is a – the Bulls did that in order to help Goran Dragic be eligible for a playoff roster. Who knows if there was a plan in place. But the Heat can sign Goran Dragic between now and the end of the regular season, and he would be playoff eligible. Um, and so it's out there now. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Follow Tim, follow Tim Reynolds of the AP – uh, closely, because if there's going to be a move to be made, I'm sure Reynolds will be the first to announce it. What do you, what do, what's your sourcing on Tim Reynolds? No, no, it's just I know the, the relationship with Gogi, as he calls him, oh, is I a pretty close one. So I, I think he, I think he, mm. I think he announced the I like Chicago this. wave, yeah, for uh, anybody else, even before Shams did. So I would I think say Chicago announced it, like that they tweeted it. So. I like this, though. I like taking bets on which reporter is going to break the news. All right, Tim Reynolds. Your, our money's on Tim Reynolds. Don't let us down, Tim. Um, all right, it's make or break time, not just for the Heat, who kick off a six-game uh, six homestand tonight against the 76ers, but also for several other teams in the NBA. Which teams should Heat fans hope implode over the next couple months so that they may pilfer their roster? That's coming up next. But first, David, tell listeners about FanDuel. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. They can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, the number of threes drained. No one would have guessed Miami would have a hot shooting night against the Philadelphia 76ers. Try your luck and place a wager on Wednesday's game. See what happens. You can discuss your favorite NBA bets for the week. You get, you just It's a great opportunity to look at all the different games that are taking place. How, how many wins does Miami continue to log on? Where Goran Dragic winds up landing? I'm sure that's probably a prop bet as well. So many exclusive bets like the, the two by three. Two three-pointers scored in the first three minutes. Not a safe bet with Miami, but still, you can always take your chances. That's why it's called gambling. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Locked on Heat is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, so please do subscribe. All right, so we have something like 20 games left this season. I know we've talked a lot about what they mean for the Miami Heat, the six-game homestand being the most important stretch of their season starting tonight against the 76ers, and then they have games against the Knicks, the Hawks, the Cavs. Uh, but it's also make-or-break time for plenty of other NBA teams as well. Uh, these teams that are on the playoff fringe, on the bubble, uh, given that the Heat will be and should be fishing for another star this offseason, potentially. Mm -hmm. At the risk of looking ahead too much, David, I thought that we could give Heat fans maybe something other than their own team winning to root for over these next couple of months. So what I want to do here is I want to rank the teams that Heat fans should hope implode over these next 20 games. What do you think? I, look, I... I think it's a little bad karma, but you know what? Why not? Keep your fires, uh, multiple fires stoked at the same time. Invest yourself in yeah. Miami season while also getting invested in another team uh, and their potential failure <laughs> so that maybe Miami could go in there and go, you know what? If you're unhappy, uh, this Miami is the best place for you. So I've got some honorable mentions before we get to the teams that really, like my, my top three teams that Heat fans should consider at least rooting for to implode, depending on how you right. feel about those teams and the players on those teams and things like that. Uh, honorable mentions are the Wizards, the Bulls, and the Minnesota Timberwolves. The Wizards, Bradley Beal in that situation. The Bulls with Zach Levine in that situation. Minnesota and Carl Anthony Towns and whatever's going to go on there. Not if, Anthony Edwards? That's not the goal there from Minnesota? I would be very, very surprised if Anthony Edwards was traded this offseason. Maybe like a Absolutely. few years from now. Yeah, I yes. mean, to me, I think Minnesota's next move is maybe we reconfigure around Gobert and Edwards and try to just put some – you know, three and D wings around those guys and, and trade Carl Anthony Towns to kind of recoup some of the draft capital that we lost in the Gobert deal. Um, I don't love the Towns fit with Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler didn't love the Towns fit with Jimmy Butler. So maybe that's just not going to be an option. Uh, <laughs> just, you could have ended a sentence midway through that. Jimmy right. didn't love Towns. So that's about it. <laughs> uh, Chicago Bulls, Zach Levine. You and I have kind of, we, we talked about this before the deadline. Eh, whatever. Bradley Beal, I feel similar. So those, those are the honorable mentions. Atlanta and Trey Young. Big name. Is this number three or is this an honorable guy, mention? My final honorable mention. Um, 
I don't. <sighs> We've talked Trae about Young Trae. is a very talented player. He's he's got a really hard ceiling. I I don't know that you're winning a championship if Trey Young is on your roster. Uh, not this configuration of Trey Young, at least. And I don't know if I want the Miami Heat to be the team that gets to try to reconfigure Trey Young. That does not seem to me as something fun to cover. But it's an honorable mention. It's out there, depending on what's going on with Atlanta, Trey Young, and Quinn Snyder, and everything that's going on there. So just something to mention. And that's what we're I feel doing. bad for Snyder. Like I, he just had a hard time trying to get Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell on the same page, and he leaves he that. Didn't situation. have to take this job. <laughs> I know. I well. I mean, I, yeah. You're right. I mean, there's 30 <laughs> jobs available. He's getting paid a heck of a lot of money for five years. Whether he makes the whole, whether he, and he would have had his pick. Years or not, he could have had his pick. Like the Rockets are going to fire Silas this summer. He could have probably went there if he wanted. I don't know. He probably yeah, wanted well, Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, that's reason. a that's a lot further. That's a lot further behind in terms of uh, contention. But yeah, taking over that Hawks roster that's been so volatile and yeah. young, basically a coach killer at this point in his career. I don't know. I don't know why he'd want to take that one on. But anyway. Um, all right, so here's the top three teams I think Heat fans should consider rooting for to your implode. top three. All right, no, it's not my top, my, three. It's my top three most interesting. Okay, right. number three is going to be the Philadelphia 76ers. We recently had a Philadelphia Inquirer columnist write that story that I uh, and about how this could be the last season of the process, and if they that 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 the Sixers and this is a Philadelphia based columnist writing that. The Sixers are not as good as the Milwaukee Bucks, are not as good as the Boston Celtics. And if they lose and don't make it out of the Eastern Conference and they don't make it to the NBA Finals for the first time during the process era, that they should that they that they should be forewarned that Joel Embiid could be on his way out. And so I don't know what kind of col- the intel this columnist has. I don't really know, but it made waves. I read the story and it's at least something to think about. And now it's out there. So if Philadelphia falls short and Joel Embiid looks around, he's like, I don't really want to do this. Maybe James Harden's like, I'm going to go back to Houston. Um, I don't know. It could be an option. So especially if they do implode, which is the point of this. Um, but if Joel Embiid is made available, it would probably cost Bam Adebayo, Tyler Hero, whatever picks that the Heat can muster and put together. And that's a lot. And I think Joel Embiid is probably going to be the he's going to be the best guy available. If any, if he is available, he'll be the best player available in the offseason. I, um, I don't I think it don't would cost much that much. I don't think it would take that much. No, I don't. I, I we seen like I know we saw some stars like Kevin Durant. You, you, no player that got traded for Durant was at the same level as Bam and Abayo. And I know that Embiid is basically one of one alongside Nikola Jokic. Uh, you know, perhaps, but I, I just don't. Bam is the centerpiece of that trade for sure. I don't know that you have to necessarily include Tyler Hero. So oh, you I could see. Potentially what you mean. Yeah, that's I, I, the BAM what's deal for about sure. Joel, yeah, so what's interesting about having to trade for Joel Embiid is that's if, if you're looking at a, a need on the Miami Heat, it's not center. Like, that's their position of strength right now. And so is, is Embiid so much of an upgrade over Bam that it would be worth whatever it would cost? I, in I for to one, Bam. will not be hosting this show anymore if Joel Embiid is on the roster. That's true. We know how you feel about it. So that's one. Portland. Is another one, Damian Lillard saying that he wants to win a championship, and that that quote went around social media. But if people kind of read the entire interview and, and everything that went there, he wasn't saying, hey, I'm going somewhere else to win a championship. He's saying, I want to win one in Portland because yeah. he, he compares the championships that Giannis won in Milwaukee and, 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 and things like that. Yeah. Um, but if the Trailblazers implode and they look around and like, hey, we're not going to be able to make the most out of this Damian Lillard window, let's do a solid for Dame and rebuild on the fly that I don't know. I I'm just sort of waiting. Everybody's been waiting for the last four years for the trailblazers to kind of pull the plug on this thing. It's probably not going to happen, but who knows? I think if it, if it goes really poorly and they miss the playoffs altogether and they miss the play in altogether, possibly who knows, maybe that's something that could happen. I, I for one, am kind of tired also of the the (laughs) constant circling of the buzzards around Portland's uh, not yet fresh corpse. You know, it's just, it's been a long time now. He's got to be, Paid north of sixty million dollars a year at some point mm-hmm. in his contract extension. That's a heck of a lot of money, and I know the perspective is well, it's all going to balance out. Once he just scored seventy one points. Deals. Hey, I'm not denying Dame's a great player. Obviously, that's the, I just I'm kind of sick of one title culture being the the dominant perspective of fandom and even some media members. Uh, uh, including a certain co-host well, they, of this podcast, <laughs> you know? So it's like... I, Dame, I, I, Dame talked about that, though, which was what I found so interesting in that story. He was like, yeah, championships do matter, 
but he just wants the one to kind of wrap up his legacy. Yeah, he's a Hall of Famer. He's one of the greatest no players doubt. in NBA history. That's not that's like nobody's gonna take that away from him. So whether he wins a ring or not, like that didn't have to matter until Michael Jordan kept rubbing it into everybody's face and saying, I got six, you got none, I got six, you got none. Yeah, the, I don't know why I don't of, know why the media gets blamed about this. It's all Michael Jordan's fault. Well, some of us <laughs> some of us kind of carry it a little <laughs> further, but that's you know, that's a whole other discussion. But yeah, you know, I, I just hope he stays in Portland forever, but I, I can't see him asking for a trade anytime soon. I think yeah, I, if he's already happening wrote it out for this long i just don't see him going you know what i'm i'm 37 and i finally need to get traded as i'm making 50 something million dollars a year or whatever I, I just don't see that possibility so then the last one and i don't even know if i did this as a power rankings or just teams that i found interesting i think i'm going yeah. that way the other team that heat fans should root to implode potentially in an interesting way however i don't know what the segment is anymore is the miami heat should uh, heat fans be rooting for the miami heat to implode if you are one of these Heat fans that are ready to blow things up, trade Jimmy Butler, trade everybody, start over around Bam Adebayo, then maybe you should just be rooting for the Heat to implode as opposed to make it through this six-game homestand, make it into the playoffs, get the sixth seed, maybe make some noise into the second round. Would you rather have that or would you rather have this team blow it up, trade Jimmy Butler for all the draft picks, and then rebuild the roster around Bam Adebayo and reopen this championship window? I'm just... I'm just giving you guys an argument. Maybe if you if you don't want to root for wins, maybe you can root for losses. It's just I'm just putting it out there. Am I am I a terrible person? Yes. Okay. I'm not even going to address that in the in the least. I like coming off that big win. Like I know there was a lot of frustration for the four game losing streak. Yeah. I'm, just I'm not picking a bad time on this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like everybody's feeling good. You got to swoop in and go. By the way, you should root for Miami to just blow. Maybe just maybe a, how's that for a take, a man? I'm swerving. Yeah, it's a sports media swerve. Wait, winning maybe not as good as people. <laughs> Is winning overrated? That's coming up next here on Locked on Heat. No. Um, do you have no, any I've other teams? That, I do yeah. have my three. Yeah, I've got my three here. Uh, it, it, this segment's probably going to go a little bit long, but that's fine. Uh, number one team right now kind of waffling there, hovering at the 10th seed in the Western Conference. Who knows what's going to happen? Big questions about their superstar player, but they've also got some nice other players in that roster. The New Orleans Pelicans, should they blow things up? What's going on there? Can they get this marriage with Zion Williamson to work, is Brandon Ingram the right fit on that team? You've got C.J. McCollum there. He seems happy, but maybe it's time to shuffle the deck a little bit and maybe send one of those players Miami's way. Who knows? That's a possibility. I would not want to be the New Orleans Pelicans right now, and I love that roster when it's healthy. It started I off love with that such team. They were, excitement. They were third in the West in early yeah. like January 2nd, I think. They were third without in the West. It was awesome. Without I had them BI. without yeah. – yeah. And Zion was just dominant, but he, that dude gets injured every year. Every single year, Miami, and I, it's just the culture it's such... will fix him. West, the culture will save him. That's just the reality. He's going to drop fifty pounds when he comes here and be in the best shape of his life. And somehow they'll keep they'll preserve. If you him. were doing like reverse matchmaker, like hey, what's the best team for Zion if he could choose his team? Miami would have to be at or near the top of that list for exactly. I know you're sort of joking, but for real, in terms of getting players in condition, nobody does it better than the Miami Heat. So. Yeah. That that and it's gotta be tough in New Orleans. I was just in New Orleans a couple weeks ago. I think I I think I looked like Zion Williamson when I left. So <laughs> I just, too much gumbo, baby. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. I mean, yeah, fun to, uh, well, I'm not sure. Look, but you know, we were talking about the addition of Goran Dragic. You know, there's another Slovenian that's kind of been put through the fire of late. I know he's pretty young and really, really damn good. Let's hope the Dallas Mavericks blow things up. Jason Kidd is a blight in this league. He is frustrated to deal with from a player's perspective, from a media perspective. I don't know what the ceiling on this team is. You've got a superstar there. You made this big trade for Kyrie. I, you know, how long can that marriage last? And, and so if you've got Dragic on the roster and kind of saying, hey, you know what? There's a place where Slovenians are welcome, where we accept that kind of culture. We'll, we'll bring the most out of a superstar. We, we talked about it before. You want to take your game to the next level, Luca? Guess what? We did that for another MVP type player in LeBron back in 2010. You come to Miami, we'll maximize your talents. And not only that, we'll get you to win. You want a championship? This is the best place for you to do so. So, yeah, yeah Dallas absolutely should blow things up this summer. And you should absolutely <laughs> I, trade Luca. I don't know what's going to happen. No, uh, I, I, why would you trade him when you could just sign him in 2026? Yeah, I suppose that's possible, but you know what? I'm just joking. For this but... exercise. Uh, <laughs> in any one. case, last one, 
the Boston Celtics. Just because, Just because. the Celtics. Yeah, it's the Boston Celtics. No, they should blow things up. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum gets frustrated. Who knows? Uh, maybe they can trade away some of their other key players on that roster. If Marcus Smart wants to leave, he can watch what a real defensive player of the year candidate does in Miami. Like, there's a lot of different good players on that roster, which makes them such a good team. But, you know, this is year, what, six, five, six of them overachieving and getting to that middle ground of like, oh, we're kind of good, really good, but not good enough to actually win anything for all the talking that Boston felt Celtics fans have done over the last half decade. They really haven't won anything as a result. So uh, they've got as many titles during that span as Miami and a whole bunch of other teams. Let's just say the Boston Celtics have, have won as many titles as the Orlando Magic and rebuilding Houston Rockets have over that last span. So why not blow things up, trade one of your star players, and what better place to do though, do so than an Eastern Conference competitor? Okay. Well, you mentioned Marcus Smart, Defensive Player of the Year last year. Bam Adebayo recently called out Marcus Smart and Rudy Gobert, yeah. saying that he should have won Defensive Player of the Year the last two seasons. We'll get into those comments and why Bam was both right and wrong. We're going to do that next here on Locked on Heat. Very well. <laughs> Reach Locked On Heat on Twitter, Instagram, email us, lockedonheat at gmail.com. Uh, Bam Adebayo had a sit down with Taylor Rooks, and in that sit down, said that he should have won Defensive Player of the Year the last two seasons. He called out Rudy Gobert and Marcus Smart by name. He said that Gobert's game, uh, Gobert, who won two seasons ago Defensive Player of the Year, he said Rudy Gobert's game doesn't translate to the playoffs. He said that he's better than Marcus Smart, last year's winner, because Bam could guard one through five, while Marcus Smart can only guard one through four. David Bam has never been shy about uh, touting his own credentials for the Defensive Player of the Year award, saying well, the that he, he the wants team to won't win do it. it, so why not? Yeah, but <laughs> this is the first time I can recall him calling out competition so directly. Um, what did you think of Bam's comments? I think they were great. I think they were great. I think it's time that he put that kind of out there because I, I feel like he he is kind of take it for granted in many ways and and, and it's the that he mentioned gladly i'm glad to say that he mentioned the same sticking point that i've always said whenever anybody asks that the ability to guard one through five is so unique and he said it you know a couple other guys in this league that could do it Giannis, draymond and him uh i'll put one other name in there what's that those are the names that he put in he said Giannis and draymond i would put There's nick claxton four. in there is those four okay that's fair um, I, I don't think Claxton's at the same level yet, you know, but I, I, no, but I, he, I can see he, that. But he, no, he can incredibly guard one, one through five. five. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I, I, you know, it's just, it's frustrating because he, he, he has been a worthy candidate and I, it's the same point of contention that I keep making is that his statistical impact doesn't always manifest in a way that's quantifiable. Like there is no statistic that exactly shows what BAM does. And so a lot of it is, uh, narrative base. You have to watch 82 games of the Miami Heat season in order for to, to really see how much of an impact he has defensively. But the things he can do, being able to guard, you know, James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, and Joel Embiid on the same night. And I don't know that there's anybody else on the planet who could do so as effectively as Bam at a bio can. And so that that's the, the you know you have to be able to watch all these games in order to see him. And, and I've mentioned this to you before. Like so much of what Bam does well is is basically negate any kind of shot. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people like to point to the statistic, oh, it's the lowest field goal percentage from any defender. You know, uh, let's say they average 50 points, 50% 50 uh, for the field, guarded by X player, they're down to 42 or 43. Well, most of Bam's possessions defensively wind up resulting in no shot whatsoever because a point guard gets switched yeah. inexplicably onto Bam, and all of a sudden you're like, well, you know what? It's time to pass the ball to somebody else. Yeah. And so you can't quantify that as a statistic. He doesn't get the same blocks by virtue of being it, a perimeter. It reminds me of defensive. like Champ Champ Bailey late in his career, lockdown mm. corner for the – and it's just like – he wasn't racking up the interceptions like he was earlier right. in his career because quarterback was just throwing, throwing to it to his side. Yeah, right. Darrell Rivas late in his career, same kind of thing. It was just you just stop throwing it to his side, and so you're not getting the interceptions, you're not getting the deflections, you're not getting any of the right. numbers. It's just your dude isn't catching the ball, and even that is more quantifiable, right. right? Is hey, the number one receiver on the opposing team caught this many passes, and it wasn't a lot of passes. That speaks right. a lot to Champ Bailey and Darrell Rivas. For Miami, it's a little bit tougher because you're, every team is still going to get 45, 50 shots in a game, whatever it's going to be. Cooper Moorhead, our friend over at MiamiHeat.com, does a really good job sort of explaining it. And he, he did so in pieces last year during the Defensive Player of the Year campaign for BAM and saying it's the shots that opponents don't take, right? It's the shots that BAM doesn't 
uh, defend, it's the ones that he doesn't have to defend because he's right. done his homework so early in the possession. To your point, it's you could say it all you want. It's nearly impossible to quantify it, and Coop did as good a job as you can. Um, it, it's hard, uh, but Bam switches better than anybody else in the league, in my opinion. Um, I, I haven't seen somebody switch as well as he does and and do it timely and with as much uh, effect and impact than anybody since peak Draymond Green. I think that's right. where I think that's where that's Bam Bam is going to be here. Um, but it's a really hard statistic. Jaron Jackson Jr. has got the blocks, right? Nick Claxton's got the blocks. Brooke Lopez has that field goal percentage stat. Like Brooke Lopez is awesome at that stat. All these things. But you look at the top five teams in defensive rating, it's Milwaukee, it's Memphis, it's Cleveland, it's Boston, it's Miami. Right. right? And so Milwaukee has a legit defensive player of the year candidate in Brooke Lopez. Memphis has got Jaron Jackson. Cleveland, you could kind of they don't really have a defensive player of the year candidate. It's a lot of Evan Mobley and Jer- uh, Jared Allen there. Boston's got Marcus Smart, obviously. And then Miami's got Bam. I think if you just looked at the top five teams in defensive rating, you say, okay, which one of their players deserves to be in the defensive player of the year race? And for Miami, it's clearly Bam Adebayo because Jimmy has not been available for a lot of the season. And he's and Bam's been doing it most of the year with uh, a six five guy next to him in the front court. No shade throwing at Caleb Martin, but that is a lot to overcome, right? An over, an undersized team, and he's, by the way, doing it off of misses most of the time because Miami Heat can't make a shot, so he's having to do it in transition a lot. So I I, I don't Plus, know. In terms can of I his, say, with, with the Bucks thing, too, it's like you can't tout Giannis as a defensive player of the year candidate in the same season as you're touting Brooke Lopez. And they, the same thing happened last year with Robert Williams and Al Horford and, and Jason Tatum. And, and, and then you was like, oh, of the four really good defenders in Boston starting lineup, let's give it to the guy that we love the most who is, you know, who, who flops the Well, most, the, the Celtics media mach- uh, uh, machine can't be stopped. I mean, the propaganda machine coming out of Boston is almost undefeated at this point. Like, it, it's ridiculous. So, uh, and, and unfortunately, no other market, including Miami, has that kind of propaganda power the way that Definitely. the Boston Celtics do. But... I, in terms of the comments themselves made by Bam, I don't, I don't have a problem with it, and I, I don't have a problem with players wanting stuff. We, we, we're, we're kind of in this era now where it's like player empowerment is so individualistic, and, and we, and it's celebrated. But yet, as soon as that individual wants something, whether it's a championship, an MVP, defensive player of the year, scoring title, we're like, oh, are you really playing the game for the right way or whatever, or the right reasons, and all these things, and I'm like. I don't know. I know Bam plays really good defense, and I know that it doesn't matter whether or not he wants Defensive Player of the Year or not. But whatever gets him to wake up in the morning and decide that he wants to be the best uh, defender in the league, I'm good with whatever that motivation is. And so I have no problem with Bam Adebayo wanting stuff, even though players do get criticized for wanting stuff. I have no issue with that. I have no issue with him calling out Rudy Gobert and Marcus Smart by name. I have no issue with that. That's just good old-fashioned trash talking. Let's go. I wish he would name out more players. He's Kawhi shouldn't have won it 10 years ago. Whatever you want to say, Bam, say it. Like, I should have won in high school, you know, o- <laughs> o- over Joakim Noah or something. Like, I don't know. Go for it. But um, I would like him to focus more on this year because he was out there oh, hard you're being, last you're, year. I cannot now, believe – you, 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 know, you get married and now you turn into a 90 year old curmudgeon or, you know, yelling at. Clowns. No, I'm saying like, keep it up, but don't focus on last year. The last two years are done. He was asked about it. He was asked about it by Taylor. No, but I, want, I know, but you be a politician, bam. I'm telling you, he's getting better is what I'm saying, but be a politician. You don't have to ask. You don't have to answer the question that is asked to you. He said, you could say, I should have won it two years, the last two years. And by the way, I should be winning it this year too. Brooke Lopez is a bum. Uh, oh, you could say wait, Jared wait, wait, Jackson this, fouls this out too wrestling. much. Come on, this isn't wrestling. Like they're, that's what I'm saying. Has to, to be for him. Heel. He doesn't have the numbers case. He needs to be out here, even though it's going to turn everybody. It'll turn off all the curmudgeonly voters. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is for Bam. I don't know if he'll ever win a Defensive Player of the Year. I really don't. He won't. He won't. Miami's not a fun team to watch, and they're not a, a big market team or big enough market team. Apparently, um, I, I don't know. I don't know how it works. I mean, nobody wants to see 85 switches per game. That's basically it. Like, like he doesn't. He doesn't have the blocks like Memphis. Everybody's watching Memphis, not because of Jaron Jackson Jr. You know, they're watching it because of John Morant. Yeah. And then they happen to see three blocks per game from a guy who does nothing else. You know, and, and I love Jaron Jackson Jr., but I, I hate that it's like you have to pick one or the other. I, just and you have to turn I, I one think blocks can be valuable and are valuable in a certain respect, but I can't believe yeah. in this era of advanced analytics that we're still like, oh, blocks. 
Like, yeah. There we go. He, I can't believe Marcus Smart shots. won it last year. Like that. That to be, Mark. Like that was just voters giving I, I, up and getting to the end of their ballot and be like, I don't, I don't mind know. He that. seems to really want it. I don't mind the Smart selection. No. Aside from it being smart, I don't mind that they gave it to a guard. Like I think that defensive impact it should not be theo the theo ratliff award of like who collects the most blocks per game or something like right. you know, knock on theo ratliff is it, it, it should be about you know greater overall defensive presence and that's why it comes out of bad like the real yeah. the real perception is he's a guy who can guard one he's, through five he, he did he say with so well he did say with rudy gobert that it doesn't translate to the playoffs yes, and when i teased point. going when i teased going into this i said bam was right and wrong i think bam was mostly right um, I think he should have, I think he got robbed last year. Bam Adebayo should have won defensive player of the year last year. Yeah. To me, that was very obvious. And to games most people, played. and to voters, I guess it wasn't. Um, yeah, the games played thing was ridiculous last year when, when you basically just decided, Hey, you know what? We don't have a guy that's running away with the award. So let's just give it to Marcus smart. Who's not even the best defender on his own team. Who's probably not yeah. even one of the best three defenders on his own team. Oh, sing it, buddy. Sing it. Like I, it, You've already given up as a voter, so now you're going to hold games played against Bam? Like, he was the better defender. I just, I don't, and it, it wasn't like Marcus Smart played, like, all 82 games. I don't know what we're, it was ridic- it's just ridiculous. Um, so, Bam got robbed last year. I don't think he got robbed two years ago. I think Rudy Go. it's a regular season award. Rudy Gobert has been an awesome regular season defender for most of his career, basically up until now, and he's still pretty good. He's not yeah. defensive player of the year good, but he's still pretty good. Um, I, I don't have an issue with Gobert winning it two years ago or the years that he won it before that either. He was, he was an awesome walking top five defense by himself. He was very deserving. He's probably going to be in the hall of fame, which is crazy, but he's, he's going to be, um, hmm. oh, so an interesting question. He's won defensive player of the year, like a billion times. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, I mean, that, that is, in and of itself does not mean enough. There has to be more in terms of like other, stat- well, yeah, you're thinking Ben Wallace, right? Yeah, he's got the rebounds. It's he's the scored, championship he's scored thing, quite though. a bit of points too. His efficiency it's, numbers it's, are really high because he always being the defensive player of the year on a championship level team, which is why Draymond's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, and he, those those Jazz teams were they never never won a championship, but they were fifty wins a year. You know, like just yeah, rolling out of bed, fifty wins a season. Um, so whatever, that's not really the conversation. But um, Bam got robbed last year. He was wrong about Gobert and the not deserving it uh but he was right about marcus smart uh not deserving it and so always that's never deserving all right thanks again for making locked oh really quick though who's your uh who do you think wins it this year defensive player of the year i think it's Darren jackson jr yeah i think it's gonna go to brooke lopez but it's probably one of those two guys mm-hmm. seems like yeah. it's those two Shifting guys Shifting a little bit yeah, yeah. It seems well it seems like it's those two and then everybody else like after the brooklyn claxton, Nets blew like, it up yeah. claxton the, the, the hype around claxton fell off i don't know i think it it's open enough where Bam can make his way into the top three, but go back on more. Hey, Bam, come on our podcast, do a little bit of a redo. And we want to hear your campaign for this year. I'm, I'm not interested anymore in the last two years. Let's, let's hear the campaign for this year. Thanks again for making Locked On Heat your first listen every day. Remember to subscribe to new episodes of Locked On Heat on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. Ring the bell to get notified as soon as new episodes go up. Now make your second listen game to game NBA every moment, every top performance, every result locked on game to game. Covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. David, thanks for joining me. You got it. To hell with Boston. <laughs> <laughs>